Mr Boris Johnson. Mr Speaker, I'm grateful. No one on either side of this House or anywhere wants a hard border. You couldn't construct one if you tried. But there certainly can be different rules north and south of the border to reflect the fact <laughs> that there are two different jurisdictions. In fact, there already are. There can be checks away from the border and technical solutions, as the Prime Minister rightly described at Mansion House. In fact, there already are. But when I and other colleagues, and I single out my right honourable friend, the Honourable Member for Horton Price and Howden, uh, proposed further technical solutions to make customs and regulatory checks remotely, those proposals were never even properly examined, as if such solutions had become intellectually undesirable in the context of the argument. And somehow, after the December joint report, whose backstop arrangement we were all told was entirely provisional, never to be invoked, it became taboo even to discuss technical fixes. So, Mr Speaker, after 18 months of stealthy retreat, we have come from the bright certainties of Lancaster House to the, the Chequers Agreement. And you put them side by side. Lancaster House said laws will once again be made in Westminster. Yeah. Chequers says there will be an ongoing harmonisation with a common EU rulebook. Lancaster House said it would be wrong to comply with EU rules and regulations without having a vote on what those rules and regulations are. Chequers now makes us rules takers. Lancaster House said we don't want anything that leaves us half in, half out. And we do not seek to hold on to bits of membership as we leave. Chequers says that we will remain in lockstep on goods and agri-foods and much more besides, with disputes ultimately adjudicated by the European Court of Justice. Far from making laws in Westminster, there are large sectors in which ministers will have no power to initiate, innovate or even deviate. After decades in which UK ministers have gone to Brussels and expostulated against costly EU regulation, we are now claiming that we must accept every jot and tittle for our economic health with no say of our own and no way of protecting our businesses and entrepreneurs from rules now and in the future that may not be in their interests. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor, was asked to identify the biggest single opportunity from Brexit. After some thought, he said regulatory innovation. Well, there may be some regulatory innovation post-Brexit, but it won't be, alas, coming from the UK and certainly not in those areas. We are volunteering for economic vassalage, not just in goods and agri-foods, but we will be forced to match EU arrangements on the environment and social affairs and much else besides. And of course, we all want high standards, but it is hard to see, I say to my honourable friends, it is hard to see how the Conservative government of the 1980s could have done its vital supply-side reforms with those freedoms taken away. And the result of accepting the EU's rule books and of our proposals for a fantastical Heath Robinson customs arrangement is that we have much less scope to do free trade deals, yeah. as the Chequers paper actually acknowledges, and which we should all, frankly, acknowledge. Because otherwise, if we pretend otherwise, we continue to make the fatal mistake of underestimating the intelligence of the public. Saying one thing to the EU about what we are doing, and then saying another thing to the electorate. And given that, in important ways, this is, in important ways, this is Bino or Brino or Brexit in name only. I'm, of course, unable to accept it, as I said, or to support it, as I said in the Cabinet session at Chequers. And I'm happy now to speak out against it and be able to do so. 
Mr. Speaker, <coughs> it is not too late to save Brexit. Yeah. We have time in these negotiations. We have changed tack once and we can change again. Yeah. The problem is not that we failed to make the case for a free trade agreement of the kind spelt out at Lancaster House. We haven't even tried. We must try now, because we will not get another chance to get it right. And it is absolute nonsense to imagine, as I fear some of my colleagues do, that we can somehow afford <laughs> to make a botched treaty now and then break and reset the bone later on. Because we have seen, even in these talks, how the supposedly provisional becomes eternal. And we have the time, and I believe the Prime Minister has the support of Parliament. Remember the enthusiasm for Lancaster House and for Mansion House. And it was clear last night, it was clear last night, it was clear last night that there is no majority in this House for a return to the Customs Union. With goodwill and common sense, we can address the concerns about the Northern Irish border and all other borders. We have fully two and a half years to make the technical preparations, along with preparations for a world trade outcome. Yeah. Those preparations which we should now accelerate. We should, should not and need not be stampeded by anyone. But let us again aim explicitly for that glorious vision of Lancaster House, a strong, independent, self-governing Britain that is genuinely open to the world, not the miserable, permanent limbo of checkers, not the democratic disaster of ongoing harmonisation with no way out and no say for the UK. We need to take one decision now before all others. And that is to believe in this country yeah. and in what it can do. Yeah. Because I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that the UK's admirers, and there are millions, if not billions, across the world, are fully expecting us to do what we said and to take back control and to be able to set new standards for technologies in which we excel, to behave not as rules takers but as great independent actors on the world stage and to do free trade deals, proper free trade deals for the benefit and the prosperity of the British people. That was the vision of Brexit that we fought for. That was the vision that the Prime Minister rightly described last year. That is the prize that is still attainable. There is time. And if the Prime Minister can fix that vision once again, before us, then I believe she can deliver a great Brexit for Britain, with a positive, self-confident approach that will unite this party, unite this House, and unite this country as well. Yeah. Order. I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman.